Okay, um, so uh, the, this talk will cover the FIPS provider in a bit more detail. We it's been mentioned numerous times in the in the two preceding talks. So I just want to go into a bit more detail uh, about that. So first of all, uh, we're going to talk about what FIPS is, what it means, uh, and what that what the FIPS provider is. Uh, we'll talk about the security policy and FIPS compliance. Uh, I'm going to go into quite a lot of detail around how to install and configure the FIPS provider. Uh, and then different ways you might use it. Uh, and then uh, very briefly, I'm going to touch on uh, using FIPS in TLS at the end. So, uh, first of all, what is FIPS? So, um, FIPS stands for the Federal, Federal Information Processing Standards. Uh, it's essentially a set of standards that have de been developed by the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the US. Um, it, it, they're, they're quite broad ranging, but um, uh, it, of interest to us is that they define numerous standards which are relevant to uh, crypto use. Um, it, depending on what your your application does that you're developing, it may be important to you or it may not. It depends what kind of market you're going into. Um, for example, if your uh, if your application is going to be used in U.S. government context, then um, often uh, FIPS compliance uh, is a requirement. Uh, as I say, it's a set of standards. One of those standards is FIPS 140-2, and that's a specific standard uh, relating to uh, cryptographic modules, um, by which we mean a, a module here, meaning a component that implements cryptographic algorithms. Modules can be hardware-based or software-based, um, uh, obviously, in our case, we're talking um, a software-based module. Um, if in order to comply with 140-2, then that uh, you know whatever algorithms you implement within that module have to comply with all of the relevant other FIPS standards um, for those algorithms. So. Um, uh, it, it's almost like an umbrella standard in that sense, in that you, if you if you comply with 140-2, then you also have to comply with a load of other standards too. Uh, you will also hear about FIPS 140-3, which is essentially uh, a more recent version of the 140-2 standard and, and supersedes it. Uh, but but nonetheless, you know 140-2 is still very commonly used, uh, and 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 uh, you'll see lots of 140-2 modules out there and um, slowly 140-3 modules are becoming validated too but but uh, still large numbers of 140-2 modules out there. Uh, so this is just a little bit about the process of, of um, how a module becomes um, validated. Uh, so there is this thing called the CMVP which is the Cryptographic Module Validation Program uh, which is a, a joint program run by NIST and the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity. Uh, and the, the job of CMVP is to validate um, uh, modules to uh, either 140-2 or 140-3 standards. Uh, and the way that that works is um, the CMVP uh, accredits uh, independent laboratories, um, uh, more commonly known as labs. Um, uh, so the lab does the work of actually testing the module. Um, it, that there are uh, a set of tests that are, are run depending on the algorithms that are available within the module. Uh, the lab then, uh, so the lab will run all those tests and, and create a report um, as well as uh, various other accompanying do documentation which goes with the module. Uh, and then they submit that um, all of that documentation to the CMVP, uh, and then once that submission is made, it normally goes into a queue, and you have to wait a long time. And then eventually, the the CMVP will uh, review that submission uh, and hopefully um, validate um, the module at the end of it. Um, uh, and which it normally takes the form of a it, well, it does take the form of a, a certificate that is um, issued at the end. So what's the FIPS provider? So our FIPS provider conforms to FIPS standards. Uh, it, it, all of the algorithms in there, most of the algorithms in there, I should say, um, conform to FIPS standards. Um, some of the versions that we create, 
are additionally validated by CMVP, but not all. So uh, obviously we, we create regular patch releases, 300, 301, 302, 303, uh, and they come out on a reasonably regular basis. But validating a module is a relatively slow process, and it's not actually feasible for us to validate every single version that we that we uh, create. So we only validate some of them. Uh, so all of so every version has a provider in it, uh, and all of those providers conform to the standards. But you have to pick and choose which version if you want an actual validated version. And at the time uh, that I wrote this presentation, and, and as of today, there are two. The 300 provider and the 308 provider are validated uh, versions. Um, it, it's worth noting that 3.0 conforms to 140-2 and 3.1 and 3.2 conforms to 140-3. But right at the moment, we do not have uh, any version from 3.1 or 3.2 which has actually been validated. It is our intention to do so, uh, but we don't have it as of today. Uh, obviously, this changes over time what um, what version is validated, and the, the validations can occur some while after the patch release is actually created. Um, so that the 308 validation occurred some while after 308 itself was issued. So um, it is worth checking back every now and then. That our, if you go to our download page, it has the latest information about um, which versions are validated and w um, uh, uh, which you can use. Uh, and if you want to see the actual certificate, there's a, a, um, a link there. Go take a look at our, our certificate, which has got all the various details of exactly what's been tested and what platforms and, and all those sorts of things. Um, uh, so the, 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 pla the platforms we tested on are all listed, and broadly those line up with uh, our primary platforms, which are listed in our uh, platform policy, which is, uh, again, linked to there. Um, uh, so also worth noting is that one of the documents that uh, accompanies the submission for validation is a security policy. Uh, that's a requirement of, of doing FIPS is you have to have a security policy. It's linked uh, from the certificate itself uh, and is available on the uh, NIST website at that link. Um, uh, it, Basically, that specifies the rules um, under which the, the provider must be used in order to be able to claim FIPS compliance. Um, so it is an important document. Uh, it's quite a dry read. Um, so if you're feeling, uh, you know, if you want to get to sleep at night, then go read the, the, the security policy. But it is important. Um, I, I'd draw your attention in particular to Appendix A, which talks about um, the steps required to install the provider. Uh, so, in order to claim FIPS compliance, you have to have these three things. You have to have a valid version, validated version of the FIPS provider on one of the tested platforms, uh, which uh, has, and the provider has to have been installed and be operated in accordance with the security policy. If you've got all of those three, three things, then you can claim FIPS compliance. Um, it may still be possible to claim FIPS compliance, even if they don't apply. Uh, but you need to go and talk to uh, a FIPS consultant or a FIPS lab to uh, get advice um, uh, if that's the case. Um, I, and I would point out the, the project can't provide you with that advice. We're not FIPS experts. Um, you, if you want to do, uh, if you want to know about that stuff, you have to go and talk to a FIPS consultant or, or a lab. Uh, it is actually possible to um, validate the provider yourself if you want to do that. Um, the easiest route to do this is you can get a basically a white label copy of um, our own certificate. So you get an exact copy of, of our certificate, uh, but you can put it in your own company name. And once you uh, have that, you can then engage a FIPS lab and uh, make changes to it. Uh, so you could change the tested platforms, make modifications to the security policy uh, or change the version of the provider that's that's been validated all of those things are possible uh, you would have to engage a FIPS lab to do that 
Um, in order to get a white label copy, you have to be a premium support customer, um, and there's a link there if you want if you're interested in that. Okay, so uh, how do we install the FIPS provider? Um, the provider itself is a loadable module, so it's a, a, a file called FIPS.so if you're on a Linux or Unix type platform, or FIPS.dll if you're on Windows. Uh, it's not built by default. You have to explicitly um, ask for it when you're building OpenSSL. Um, in the normal case, what you're going to want to do is run the most up-to-date, the latest patch version of OpenSSL that's available. Uh, so the latest version of LibCrypt, so LibSSL and, and, and the apps, um, but with a validated version of the FIPS provider, which is likely to be a, an older version. Um, typically, the validations lag behind the very latest version. Um, so uh, just a, a brief note to say that I'm talking here about our own FIPS provider. Uh, it, it may be possible to get a FIPS provider from somewhere else. Um, uh, and I'm, so I'm not talking about those things. If, you, if you're if you using somebody else's FIPS provider, go look at uh, the instructions for, for that provider. Okay, so uh, to install the FIPS provider, first of all, we need to get the latest validated version. Uh, I'm using 3.0.8 in this example because that is, as of today, the latest version. But if, uh, you know, but, but please go check as it does. It may change over time. Uh, so, you basically you download the, uh, the 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 tar file, un un untar it, um, change into the directory, and you run the configure script with the enable FIPS option. That tells us to build the FIPS provider, uh, and then we run make to to build it. Uh, if you already have an installation which contains libcrypto, libssl, you know, the, the standard OpenSSL installation. You can install, you can just install the the FIPS module directly into it. Uh, and uh, there's the command on on, uh, on the screen there to do that. This does assume that your OpenSSL dir value is, is the same for the what you've just built and where you're installing it into. Um, if you got your version of OpenSSL from a third party, such as from your Linux distribution, then it's quite possible that the OpenSSL dir value won't match. Um, so that won't work in that case. Um, if you haven't got a, an installation to, of OpenSSL to install into, then you can, uh, then we can do that as well. So in this example, I'm downloading and installing the, the very latest version, which is 3.2.0 right at the moment. So we download that, that tar file, uh, we un untar it, CD into it and configure it, and we enable FIPS again, uh, and, we, and we build that. So we, now we have two versions built. We have the, the 3.2 version, 3.2.0 version and the 3.0.8 version. Uh, and now this is a, a little bit tricky. Basically, we have to copy two files over from the validated version. We copy those across into the 3.2.0 version. Uh, we're interested in the FIPS.so file and the FIPSmodule.cnf file, a, a, a FIPS module configuration file. We copy those two files into the 3.2.0 directory. Uh, I, I'm not going to read out the commands that are on the screen. You can look at the uh, you can look at the slides later. Uh, but once you've copied those two files across, you can run the command which is at the bottom of the screen there, which is uh, runs the OpenSSL list command um, and uh, checks the available providers. Um, and you should see this output, um, which basically says that we have the base provider loaded. Note that so the base provider is at 3.2.0 version, and we have the FIPS provider loaded, which is at the 3.0.8 version. That's what we expect to see once we're at this stage in the process. Assuming all of that's worked as expected, you can just run the, 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 the tests uh, and, it, uh, and run the make install command to install uh, the 3.2.0 version with the 3.0.8 uh, provider. So at this stage, we have installed OpenSSL. 
we have uh, installed uh, the, uh, the validated version of the FIPS provider. Uh, you probably need to check that you're using the version that you think you've just installed. So run the OpenSSL version command. You should expect to see, well, in these instructions, we've used a 3.2.0 version, so that's what we should expect to, to get back. Uh, you should confirm that the, this, you'll notice there's two version numbers on that, uh, that version line. Check that they're the same. Um, uh, if they're not, then you're probably using the OpenSSL application from one location and the library from somewhere else, and you, you don't want that. You need them to be matching. Um, if you don't get back the version that you're expecting, then you might need to make some um, environment changes. So typically, you're going to want to change your uh, your uh, path environment variable or your LD library path or whatever is appropriate for your particular platform. Uh, so uh, when I tried this on my uh, on my machine, if I run the OpenSSL version command, I pick up the system version of OpenSSL, not the one I just installed. Um, uh, so I was getting the 302 version. Uh, so I made some changes to my path and my LD library path to point at the version I just installed, which was in a different location. And now when I run OpenSSL version, I get the, the actual version that I wanted, the 320 version. OK, so we've installed it, but we haven't configured it yet. Um, uh, we need to configure OpenSSL to actually use it. Uh, the default configuration file that comes with OpenSSL does have some placeholder configuration that you can amend. Uh, so the first step is go find your OpenSSL.cnf file, which will have been installed into the OpenSSL dir directory. Uh, so load it into an editor. Um, uh, if you want to find out what your OpenSSL dir version is, uh, the value is you can run OpenSSL version minus D and it will tell you. So if in my case, it's in uh, in that location on the screen. Um, right, so load the configuration file into an editor. Go and find the line in that configuration file that includes the file pipsmodule.cnf. You'll see a, a dot include pipsmodule.cnf line and it will be commented out. You, um, you need to uncomment it so that it becomes active, and you need to replace the FIPSmodule.cnf file with the full absolute path to the FIPSmodule.cnf file. Don't use a relative path. Um, it causes all sorts of problems when you do that. Make sure you use the full absolute path. Uh, and uh, you also need to find the line which says FIPS equals FIPS underscore sec. It will be commented out. You need to uncomment that. Okay, so that's that's all of the changes you need to make to the main config file. Alongside it, you should expect to see a FIPS module.cnf file, which contains configuration specific to the FIPS module. For the purposes of this presentation, um, we're actually going to deactivate the provider. Uh, so, um, uh, the configuration will still be there so that it's available if we want to load the FIPS provider the configuration is there but we're just not going to activate it by default and the way we do that is we just comment out the activate equals one line don't set it to zero it doesn't work just comment it out um, okay so hopefully if all of that worked you can run the OpenSSL list command again supply the, the arguments as I've, as I've supplied on the screen to load the FIPS and the base provider. So I'm explicitly asking in this command, please load the FIPS provider and the base provider. Uh, and you should see this output on the screen. It will list the providers that it's loaded. So we expect to see the base provider at version 3.2.0, and we expect to see the FIPS provider at version 3.0.8. If we don't explicitly ask for the base and FIPS providers to be loaded, if we just run OpenSSL list minus providers, we're not making, we're not saying anything about what providers to load. It will just load the default provider. So we expect to see OpenSSL default provider at version 3.2.0 if everything has worked uh, uh, according to plan. There is, a, I know I've gone through this fairly quickly. 
Uh, the slides will be available, uh, but there is also a readme-fips.md file uh, in the distribution, uh, which documents all of this stuff. Go read that, it tells you how to do this. Okay, so hopefully we're at the point where we have built OpenSSL, we've built the FIPS provider, we've installed it, we've configured it, we're ready to use it. But how do we use it? What can we do? Um, so uh, the important point is in order for an application to be able to claim FIPS compliance, uh, it must be using the FIPS provider and the algorithms that are in that FIPS provider, and it mustn't use anything else. Uh, so you can't use any um, legacy APIs. So those low-level APIs are often, so there are numerous APIs in OpenSSL which uh, are algorithm-specific. So you might see RSA sign or SHA-256 in it. Uh, there's various AES functions. Don't use any of those algorithm-specific functions. Those are low-level cryptographic APIs. They're all deprecated, uh, and they avoid the use of the FIPS provider. So in order to proclaim FIPS compliance, you can't use those. You mustn't use any engines because they are going to provide an alternative implementation to what's available in FIPS provider, which is not what you want. Uh, you can't use any custom methods. So uh, any of the APIs uh, around methods you can't use. So EVP MD meth new or EVP cipher meth new, anything like that, you can't use any of those things. It's worth noting that all of these things that I'm talking about are all deprecated in the 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 three o version and above. Um, so the simplest thing to be sure that you're doing the right thing is not to use any deprecated functions at all. Uh, you might consider using the minus w deprecated compiler for bag if if that's available to you uh, so that you know for sure whether you're using deprecated APIs or not. Okay, so um, there's various ways that uh, you can set things up um, to ensure that you're FIPS compliant. Um, so one simple way is just uh, you change the default config file to uh, load the default, uh, sorry, to load the FIPS provider and the base provider by default. Uh, you do that for the global config file. So every application on your system is gonna be using uh, the FIPS provider. Uh, it's simple, but it does have some fairly significant drawbacks doing things that way. Um, most obviously, you might actually want everything uh, using the FIPS provider. Um, you, you know, there may be one particular application you want to use FIPS, but everything else doesn't need to. Um, uh, although you've set it up in the configuration file to use FIPS, an application can actually override what's in the config file. It can actually choose to ignore the config file and do its own thing. So if your application has been written in that way, it doesn't matter what's in the config file, it's still not going to use FIPS. Um, uh, and then there's another issue is that if an application hasn't been written with FIPS in mind, it may actually be using things which aren't available in the FIPS provider. There might be algorithms that it needs. Um, or things that are, or capabilities that it needs that the FIPS provider doesn't supply. Don't forget the FIPS provider is just a subset of what's in default and some of the behavior is, is modified. So if an application needs any of those things, it's likely to break. Um, and again, if an application is using deprecated APIs, then again, it may not use FIPS. So although you can set it in the in the config file, it doesn't. it's not a guarantee that actually everything is gonna use FIPS. Uh, so, but if you do want to go this route, um, then uh, the way to go is you, you go to your default um, uh, config file, you specify the FIPS equals yes default property in the config file, and if you remember back in the previous talk that Thomas gave, um, uh, there was uh, there were some slides about uh, how to configure and how to set the default properties, so go look at that, that talk again. Uh, and you can set your default properties to be FIPS equals yes, and also reverse that change that we made in the FIPS module.cnf file to, uh, uh, to uncomment the activate equals one line so that the FIPS provider is available by default. Um, and don't forget, you might also want to activate, you probably do also want to activate the, the base provider. Uh, and 
So here is, uh, here's a simple config file which just loads the FIPS and the base provider by default and activates them. Uh, and uh, we've got the default properties uh, being set there as well. Uh, so if that, if you do that and, and that's worked, then when you run the OpenSL list minus providers command, you're, again, you should expect to see the base and the FIPS provider loaded um, as per the configuration. Okay, so that's not the only way to do things. You can be more selective um, and uh, it, it's more likely that you only want specific applications to be to, to use the FIPS provider. Uh, so one way to do that is just use a different config file. So you, you can uh, um, either take a copy or create a new config file um, according to the, the, the instructions that we've given you uh, in earlier slides. Um, uh, and so set things up as you want them with the FIPS provider and the base provider loaded. And then just when you run your application, make sure that um, it's using that version of the config file. And a simple way to do that is to use the OpenSSL underscore conf environment variable, set that up to point to the location of the, of the config file that you want and, and run your application. And it will use the config from there. Uh, so this has the advantage um, that it's much more selective. You can choose which applications you want to use FIPS. Everything else can just use the default configuration, but for, for these specific applications, these ones are going to use this special config file uh, and uh, will load the FIPS and, and base providers. Um, it does still have some disadvantages, um, uh, which are basically all the same as the previous ones. Um, it, you know, if the application has been written to avoid the config file and this is still not going to work and it might be using algorithms um, which aren't in the FIPS provider or if it's using deprecated APIs then again it's not going to use FIPS so you may have to make changes to your application to be sure that you're uh, using FIPS. If you want to do this in uh, programmatically here's the way to do it there are uh, you can basically use the OSL provider load APIs to load the FIPS and the base provider. You just need to make sure that you check the return value of that, make sure they're not null. Uh, if, if when you attempt to load the FIPS provider, you get a null return, it's almost certain that you have uh, failed to uh, configure and install the FIPS provider as per the previous instruction. So this, this implies that this requires you to have uh, set things up as I've previously described. The config file needs to be there uh, with all of those FIPS, uh, FIPS configuration settings. As long as you've done that and, and uh, the OpenSSL list command worked as expected on the previous slides, then hopefully this should work. Uh, but if it, if it does return null, go check those things again. Um, it's worth noting that if you're doing this programmatically after you've loaded them at the end of your application, you should then unload them um, at the end. Load those providers as the first thing you do if you start using OpenSSL APIs and then load them later, then it's very likely that the default provider will automatically get loaded, which is probably not what you want. Um, having said that, um, sometimes that might be a valid thing to do. You might want FIPS and the default provider loaded at the same time into the same library context. Um, uh, because you you may want the flexibility that actually for this particular set of API calls, I want to do FIPS things, and for this other set of API calls, I, I don't care about FIPS, it's something else. Um, that, that does happen in real applications, so it could be a valid thing to do. Um, so you can either do that programmatically or via config. You can load the default provider at the same time. If you're going to do that, though, you, you really must use property queries to... Uh, uh, to determine which implementation of an algorithm you're going to use in any one uh, given uh, scenario. And again, look at um, Thomas's uh, talk from earlier uh, for, for more details about that. Um, so uh, in for this example, um, I'm going to uh, set my default properties to FIPS equals yes. So uh, if I do nothing else, if FIPS equals yes, then I know that the, the algorithm implementations I'm going to be fetching will be FIPS compliant. Um, 
but you can then override that if you've got the default provider loaded then uh, so at the the fetch at, at the bottom there i'm going to use an algorithm which isn't in the fips provider i need to use md5 for some reason so i can do an, a fetch and then i can uh, i can specify the minus fips property which says take away the fips equals yes which is is uh, the default uh, i don't care about this for this scenario just go get me um the md5 algorithm uh, and, and that will override that okay um uh, another way to do to this um uh, to have FIPS and default loaded at the same time is to actually use two different library contexts. So in one library context, you you, you load the FIPS and base providers, and in another library context, you load the default provider, uh, and then you just use the right library context um, uh, for the right situation. Um, just make sure you always you choose the right library context and you should be fine. Um, it's actually common to create two custom library contexts for that, and then just never use the default library context. Um, and this is where you might use the null provider that we talked about earlier. So you just load the null provider into the default library context so you never accidentally use uh, that, that context and accidentally use an algorithm from somewhere else that you weren't expecting. And then you always explicitly choose which context to use. So, uh, so here's some examples here. Um, so I create two library contexts, one called FIPS and one called non-FIPS. Um, I'm gonna load the null provider into my default library context so I can't accidentally use the default library context. I'm going to load the config file, the FIPS config file, uh, a FIPS specific config file, which has got my FIPS and provider, uh, base providers activated in it uh, into my FIPS library context. And then I can just use those library contexts as I see fit. So um, in the top line there, I'm going to fetch a digest from using the FIPS library context. That was going to give me FIPS validated crypto and in the bottom line, I'm going to fetch an algorithm from the non-FIPS non library context. So that's going to use non-FIPS validated crypto. Uh, and so just a final uh, note here about using the FIPS provider in TLS. It, uh, LibSSL is fully compatible with the FIPS provider. So it's perfectly possible just to use the FIPS and base provider with, uh, with LibSSL. Um, so you just set things up as I've described, um, load the FIPS and base providers, set the FIPS equals yes default property query, um, and, and it will just work. If, if, if you set your default library context up in that way, it should just work. Um, if you can use a non-default library context if you want to, uh, and if, if you're going to do that, then you have to use the SSL context underscore new underscore X function which enables you to create an SSL context with a specified uh, library context uh, with a specified FIPS, uh, FIPS equals yes property query, if you so wish. You can use that. Any SSL object created from that context will then use that library context and you'll get your FIPS validated crypto. And that's it for this talk.